So um, from, starting from the CV, this, this introductory slide already shows a little bit of, of my background and be, always being interested in signaling in the cardiovascular system, uh, starting with synthetic um, neurotransmitters, um, G protein coupled receptors at that time, but, but getting the feeling that, that many of the cardiovascular signals that are actually disease relevant are not only short-term adaptations, but long-term decisions, which brought us over the years deeper and deeper inside of the cell so that we actually uh, finally ended up in the nucleus. And I, I do apologize a little bit that um, in the end, we're now uh, heavily stuck in the cardiac myocyte nucleus where we're sequencing, sometimes we say, the hell out of the nucleus. Okay, so I'd like to uh, take you uh, through this a little bit. And um, now, um, the heart is just, I mean, this is very well known uh, all of here, but I always think uh, this is a fascinating organ. organ. It's the first to develop during embryonic development very early in mouse, but also very early in, in, in human life. Pumps blood throughout, despite the growth, the initial growth, in utero, where it can beat and divide, it loses the proliferative, as we discussed this morning, proliferative capacity. And the thought is that the adult heart cannot beat and divide. So I, I see a discrepancy, and we don't have a real good understanding of why this is. And, and certainly, the limited reparative capacity is a very important topic that uh, is very well investigated here. So. Um, coming from the um, uh, stages of um, cardiovascular diseases that end up in chronic heart failure, we asked the questions, what are the long-term adaptive changes that surviving cardiac myocytes might engage in? And what is really this fetal gene program, the pathological gene expression program? I'm not giving you an answer, because the deeper and deeper we dig into the system, the, the, the areas of this fetal gene program also driving chronic heart failure is, it becomes fuzzy, and, and um, we may discuss this in the end. So starting off with sympathetic regulation from the past, we've been looking at acute effects inside of cardiac myocytes, maybe calcium cycling, phosphorylation events, um, rhythm, but now we're actually kind of aiming to understand how beta uh, and other signal receptor signals end up in the nucleus. So I'd like to bridge these worlds, and that's why this scheme kind of ends up in the DNA, at the at DNA level with DNA modifications, histone modifications, and maybe uh, a multitude of additional mechanisms. So what, what um, our department over the past um, very few years now is, is trying to, and we've been starting to do, is to dissect the heart into the individual cellular components, ask the question, which cell type is the primary affected cell type in any kind of uh, cardiac disease, and then analyzing the mechanisms with a focus on the nucleus in, um, inside of these cells. A big focus has been in our lab so far, the investigation of the cell types from the uh, life, from the living uh, complex organ, may it be mouse or human, and we're trying to isolate cell nuclei um, as, as the initial focus. So epigenetics, um, I brought from Würzburg, a tall guy, <laughs> Dirk. Uh, our DNA in every cell of our body has almost, if we uh, link this together, the size of uh, Durculus here. Um, and that has to be squeezed into a few micron nucleus. That's being achieved by wrapping the DNA helix around the histone proteins, which may either be, either be open or condensed into heterochromatin. Um, now, um, a few numbers on, on, on the side, uh, and I will go back to this. We have around 20,000 coding genes in the uh, most recent um, genome annotated, uh, the same number of non-coding genes, as all of you aware. The number of genes that we can detect based on the RNA level for a cardiac myocytes is also pretty large. 
um, as I will mention later, were almost disappointed how many general genes housekeepers were in the past. Housekeepers were, how many housekeepers, gap DH, everybody had maybe one housekeeper, but these were few. But housekeepers are actually big, and the number of genes that are specific for each cell type is, is rather small. But we detect over 10,000 genes to be expressed in cardiac myocytes, at least on the RNA level. So epigenetics, uh, we focus on mostly DNA methylation, histone modifications, not so much the remodeling of the chromatin yet, and only a very little bit I will touch upon uh, the microRNAs. So uh, DNA, I'll uh, briefly introduce the processes. DNA methylation mostly occurs at CG sequences, which are symmetrical, and that's why they're uh, uh, allowing this modification to be inheritable, because if, if both daughter strands of the DNA will end up in, in daughter cells after cell division, this um, methylation of the cytosine may be uh, recapitulated by the DNMT1 methyl transferase on the new synthesized strand and can be going into the daughter cell. I think we don't really know whether this can also go through the germline into the next generation, but this is something um, that comes later. I will briefly mention, because I think conceptually this is still, although it's published some time ago, um, a reader protein. DNA methylation can be recognized as many of the other features on the DNA by special reader proteins. I will not have the time to mention um, our efforts to characterize the role based on mouse models on the DNA methyl transferases and the erases of this, uh, the TET enzymes. But there is, so it's basically a dynamic model by showing that these modifications are brought by enzymes. Similar to the multiple histone modifications, where we currently mostly focus on, on the canonical marks that are either active or inactivating gene expression. But um, uh, we'll go through this. So conceptually, when we started this uh, transcriptomics, we were grinding up tissue and uh, were mixing cells. And then we, we uh, came into uh, the investigation of, um, of cell types, and we realized epigenetics has to be cell type specific. I know some bioinformaticians say, well, there are algorithms that you can deduce from a blood sample what happens in the tissue. That um, is, I guess, still a debate and conceptually very difficult. Basically, the assumption is that if we want to understand the epigenetic signature, may it be the histones or even gene expression uh, in a particular cell type, we have to take that cell type to be absolutely sure. So epigenetics specific for all cell types as opposed to genetics, which with the exception maybe of a tumor, which may have its own genetics, um, where you can uh, use DNA from tip to toe. Here it needs to be the cell type. And of course, that is a technical challenge. We started off a couple of years ago with, um, uh, when, when um, Jonas Friesen and, and Olaf Bergmann published from the Karolinska this, this paper where they showed from, where they looked at proliferation of cardiac myocytes in human samples obtained from Swedish pathology that they were able to decorate cardiac myocyte nuclei from human cardiac biopsies, biopsies with PCM1, a protein that would uh, be highly enriched in, in, in cardiac myocyte nuclei for a reason that I guess still is, is completely unknown, that we thought, okay, uh, can, can't we use this? And I, I know that uh, at that time, after reading the paper, I called Stefan Jowinge from Lund. He said, Lutz, yes, let's collaborate. Um, you just need to send us some <coughs> tissue. Okay, yeah, we have a tissue bank, so I'll, I'll ask the biobank, how much do you need, Stefan? He said, well, per, per, per sample, 500 gram. It's, it would be sufficient. Okay. 500 gram. So now, if, if a couple years later, we're down to this, with the advent of genomics, basically we're scaling down everything. We're not for everything down at a single cell level, but frequently RNA-seq is 100 cells, <laughs> and, and RTAC-seq is maybe 50 cells, and so on. But 
In mice, it's now routine in the lab by uh, Cree-mediated GFP-like markers to sort from a, cardiac ma uh, from a mouse heart with these uh, fluorescent markers at least five to six um, cell types. And you see here on the RNA-seq, for instance, cardiac myocyte, myosin heavy chain is expressed, but not the other marker genes. So it's possible, it's easy in mice to separate the cell types and then ask the questions. And that is, uh, I didn't bring this recently, a uh, postdoc in the lab looked into a diabetes model and he was totally disappointed. He said, we're not working on diabetes, why not? Because in the heart he saw only 14 genes being differentially expressed. Should we pay all the money and time to sort the cells? He said, we don't know. So let's just do it. He did it, and he sorted these cells, and every individual cell type had three to 500 differentially expressed genes, which if you add them up to the tissue, the mixture is so diverse that you can't find. So I guess that's one thing that we learn. Uh, the number of um, changes that occur when, you, when one looks specifically increases by an order or two orders of magnitude. Mouse heart, um, I'll indicate the species on the right. Um, the mice are born with a, a majority cardiac myocyte heart. Of course, protein biochemistry, mitochondrial biochemistry, and heart biopsies will probably, because the cardiac myocytes are so huge, enrich for everything that's happening in cardiac, in cardiac myocytes. But for transcriptomes for, for, or for epigenetics, the number um, so uh, is important. So we have big cells, but few cells. Born, myocytes, uh, um, mice are born with around 70% cardiac myocytes. These are the green ones. In the adult stage, it's down to 30%. I can't tell you whether they are lost, so this is not absolute quantification. But at least the ratio changes. Uh, the, in, the black um, column here is nuclei, probably mostly increasing numbers of fibroblasts and endothelial cells. In heart failure, this is uh, chronic aortic constriction. The TAC model, the, um, the situation decreases. Now, um, um, just a few things that are not really complete stories yet. Um, when I talk to, at our Max Planck Institute to the epigenetics aficionados, they say, well, cardiac gene expression is, of course, controlled, or gene expression in the nucleus. Nowhere else. Well, this I should not mention to a microRNA world. But if we take from mouse hearts either um, cardiac myocyte nuclei on the left or after Langendorf and fax sorting intact cardiac myocytes and ask, do we see difference? Do we see the same genes on? No. We see differential regulation. So the myocyte is not like a lymphocyte where you don't have cytoplasm or almost no cytoplasm and no RNA world happening out of the nucleus. But here we see, for instance, BNP is a nuclear-regulated gene. You see here um, the cellular RNA-seq, so Langendorf isolated, the RNA traces clearly increases. In the nucleus, the same picture. And also on the RNA polymerase, CHIP-seq, suggesting that BNP at least largely is activated by recruiting, and we're looking at de novo versus the mechanisms of RNA recruitment. RNA is de novo recruited, <coughs> makes more RNA in the nucleus, and then we have more RNA in the, and, and it's probably, no, it's not probably. We know that BNP is also occurring as a protein in the serum. <coughs> a number of examples, MALAT1 is one, one of them, which looks exactly opposite. We have a huge increase in the cell, monster, the, one of the biggest that we ever see, no change in the nuclear RNA of MALAT1, no change in the RNA pulse signal. And then if we quantitate which genes are mostly regulated on the nuclear level, on, on the cellular level, I must admit that epigenetics is only part of it, something in the round a quarter of genes. The remainder seems to be fine-tuned within the cytosol. And uh, bioinform we've done bioinformatics to say, well, 
of course, there are microRNAs in here. But is it easy to see that this, all of the cellular regulated, so probably cytosolic, this includes the nucleus, um, are these microRNA targets, are the micro-regulated microRNAs regulating these targets? Bioinformatics don't really s tell us this. So um, we're looking at the smaller part, and this is an advertisement for more studies into this bigger part. Um, um, completing this question is how many, how many genes do we find in cardiac myocytes being expressed? When we rank, now this is nuclear RNA-seq, when we rank genes from highest level of expression to lowest and uh, take all 22,000 genes or so and also use the histones mark, histone marks, this is the um, area plus minus um, standard uh, era of DNA contamination. So. At, at a certain point in time, we may have a uh, um, small DNA contamination, but if we rank this, we, we end up in the area of 12,000 genes. This is the level of expression based on FPKM um, that you might count. And this nicely fits this, this uh, level here with, with an increase of, of inactive histone marks or this drop of the uh, active histone marks, which are shown here. So probably not only the RNA detection has its cut off here, but somewhere here is also the, the gene mark on or off. So myocytes have in the nucleus quite a large number of genes that are active. I would like to spare all of the mouse work that we did over the past years to, um, to characterize this. And, and go directly to the human. Um, uh, as this is one technically possible, we're taking frozen cardiac tissue, non-fixed, and um, the PCM1 um, well method to, to isolate nuclei was developed on four frozen human pathology cardiac tissue. So uh, this is actually PCM1 seems to work very well for postnatal cardiac myocyte nuclei. Different species. We've now tested, I guess, pig with Christian Kupert, uh, sent us some samples, but we didn't really sequence. But isolation, rabbit, rat, um, and 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 human, of course. However, uh, I must admit, is post PCM1 is a postnatal marker. Um, we used for this um, fetal study throughout uh, additional markers. Phospholamban is a easy to uh, guess target that nicely decorates uh, cardiac myocyte nuclei throughout um, throughout life. So mostly we use uh, phospholamban either as the uh, uh, the single marker for nuclei or phospholamban and. So this is uh, based on now a study where we isolate nuclei throughout life from fetal week 20 until adult life and in a terminal heart failure. And you might, I might repeat and sequence the hell out of it. So how does this look if we take now a human heart tissue, grind it up, isolate nuclei, and stain it with PCM1 and or phospholamine? Other, in contrast to the mice, you, you see here, this is the DNA stain, and this is the PCM1 signal on the fax diagram. You can see clearly non-myocytes, so lower signal and myocyte nuclei. We do see different populations. This may not be the most um, beautiful fax diagram. I'll jump to this side. Um, whereas in fetal and infant human cardiac myocyte, the population of 2N uh, myocyte is, is the majority. In the adult non-failing, this population is probably 55 plus minus a few years of age. Um, this is 2N, 4N. And in terminally failing, we see even, we can't do this blinded because if these failing samples go into the facts, you can easily see that if the population is large here, you have a diseased sample. I don't bring data, but uh, just one sentence. We are asking the question if these large nuclei are the ones that are in cells that are sick or the nuclei, are these the failing nuclei and these are the healthy ones? So um, we're still battling a little bit with the technique and the scatter, so this is not a clear no, 
but I'm surprised to see that at present time, with the limitations of the technique, the gene expression profile in these different sizes of caric myocyte nuclei seem to be surprisingly similar. If it's identical, we need to see. I thought these guys are in huge cells, so they have lots of ANP or BNP, and these must have a signature that's sick, and these are healthy. We need to work on this a little bit more. However, the percentage of cardiac myocyte from birth around almost 90% uh, fetal life, uh, birth 80, non-failing adult human, 30% of cardiac myocytes, not too much of a change here. After purification, we see over 95%. So this is a fair comparison now uh, to, to go into the samples. DNA methylation, technically easy to be detected. Um, bisulfite incubation of purified DNA will uh, be protected if it's a methylated cytosine because that remains uh, methyl cytosine after sequencing, whereas an unmethylated will be, will be converted to, to a different base, in this case uracil. And so this can distinguish just by isolating the DNA, um, the, uh, the, the DNA methylation. Just one example. <clears throat> this is not human. I brought this because uh, here the trace is now NASA for mouse. You see traces. This, these are the loci of alpha and beta uh, myosin happy chain, and this is uh, the genomic region. And on the y-axis, you see the level of DNA methylation, 100% DNA methylation, and zero. Did you see in, uh, let's look into adult cardiac myocytes that are healthy. The loci are completely demethylated. Um, newborn cardiac myocytes have a little bit higher signal. I removed the embryonic stem cells, where these two loci are usually fully methylated. <laughs> so there's, you might say there's some unwrapping, uh, of, at least of DNA methylation. If we now take mouse endothelial or macrophages, you see a completely different signal. So endothelial cells, what I was saying, cell types have a specific signature that's seen here. And you, if you mix this up, of course, then things start to become crazy. However, I will, I will not spend too much time about the DNA methylation of the gene body. I will just show one slide in a second. But there is an additional signal, which I think conceptually may even be more important. So there are these large genes. They are demethylated. But then we see these short traces of DNA demethylation, even smaller here, these little dips. And if one uh, does bioinformatic analysis in these short dips, they contain transcription factors. They are very highly enriched in these, what we call low methylated regions, very localized, somewhere next, sometimes in these genes. And these are, I will go back to these, these are the cis-regulatory sites, based also on histone marks and so on, the master switches of turning genes on and off. Um, that's, that's, those are probably the hubs where all of the extracellular signals go to these enhancers or repressors and then turn on any gene in the vicinity. Just one slide for um, this gene body methylation that I showed here. We did observe that the um, cardiac myocytes genes, um, for, for instance, from the sarcomere, have different patterns of DNA methylation, in this case, human. Um, for instance, the fetal uh, version of the uh, sarcomere, which has these um, isoforms uh, of uh, sarcomeric genes expressed versus the adult version, in the ones that are red here, they're expressed and demethylated in the fetal part. Um, TNNI1, for instance, this one, and is later being switched off and regains methylation. And the opposite. With this switch, um, we go from TNNI1 to I3. I3 is demethylated, you see this here, uh, and is starting to be expressed. In the mouse, we test it whether this is actually a co-phenomenon or linked with expression. So we can use the mice lacking the TET enzymes and the DNA methyltransferases. And if we um, 
at, uh, knock out either of the two processes, we see that it's an active process. So first DNA methylation and then the expression. So uh, we feel that genic DNA methylation is at least involved in the process of this fetal to adult cardiac myocyte switch. Now then, we analyze the whole genome and ask where is DNA methylation um, changing between human fetal week 20, so half through pregnancy, until adult life. And we see lots of changes here. I call this development. Let's say start at um, fetal week 20 until birth. Then the hatched area is postnatal development. These are the number of changes that occur during fetal week 20 to 60 years of life. And then the next is at age of 60, what happens in a terminally failing heart? Well, there is 0.3% of all changes. I come to the numbers in a second. That is formally statistically significant, something we can detect, but it's probably not so. Well. We don't know the biological relevance of this, and we don't know whether the re remaining part of our purification or impurities in the technical aspects may cause this. So lots of prenatal and postnatal changes. Where are these occurring? Well, we call these low methylated regions the short sequences of demethylation, and we see 100,000 of those low methylated regions. Remember? 10 to 12,000 genes that are switched on, and 100,000 low methylated regions. If we look at these demethylated regions, they're usually very short, a few hundred base pairs wide. In average, you see here minus plus five per base around the center of one of those regions. We can follow their fate. Um, some of them are demethylated based on carrying the next stage to demethylation, 5-hydroxymethyl, and um, so um, this is probably also an active process by seeing this demethylated signal. If we analyze these short dips, these low methylated regions, some are not present in fetal but are appearing in uh, adult hearts. And if you take this, those contain transcription factor binding sites. These are the stable ones. You can see this red trace is probably similar to this red trace. Um, and not shown here, and then some that are already present in fetal life and disappear later are also show transcription factors. And the transcription factors and the associated processes are like a, a, a map of who is who in cardiac biology. The second aspect of these regulatory sites is they're, they're highly enriched for genetic SNPs that have been associated with a number of cardiac diseases. So for instance, in cardiac myocyte, human cardiac myocyte, low methylated, those 100,000 regions are highly enriched for uh, uh, in uh, um, this uh, pink with cardiac arrhythmia, coronary heart disease, congenital. The signal is not so strong because there are few genetic uh, studies that could be integrated here. But um, here's one example, where there is a cardiac potassium channel. And um, this is 50 kilobases, so quite a distance away. There's a large number of SNPs that are occurring in these low methylated regions. They are active, probably, because there is 27 <coughs> acetylation of a histone. There is um, lysine-4 monomethylation. That is a strong signal for calling this low methylated region an enhancer. So there is an enhancer that is highly enriched for genetic SNPs. And we, if we use bioinformatic annotation of the gene, you see here uh, all of this is called promoter by using <coughs> multiple states. Yellows are potential enhancer sequences, and this is enhancer. Why am I stressing this? Because we have now 100,000 regu 100, regulatory sites. There are somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, um, the whole genome sequencing is expected for basically all diseases to, to, um, 
to uh, now be able to map this to like an epigenome map and say, is a SNP here relevant or is it here relevant? We can now use these maps to tackle those SNPs and we can discuss how to functionally investigate the relevance of these. Now, what happens in disease? I have mentioned ANP and BNP, and you see the RNA being increased, increased also in human heart failure. The DNA methylation signal in the normal heart on these two genetic loci looks terribly identical. You can overlay them, and you cannot, uh, could not distinguish them again. And if we take all differentially expressed genes, either being downregulated or upregulated in human heart failure, DNA methylation at these genes or their promoters is pretty much um, similar. There is some scatter, one may want to look at this or that, but that's a 5% change. 5% is basically biologically irrelevant. However, the active histone marks at ANP, BNP loci, 27 acetylation, is largely increased here, or trimethylation of, um, so if we put those together, the histone marks mark the disease-relevant genes. So this summarizes the, the human part um, very briefly, that we see changes in the DNA methylome during development at gene bodies and at um, regulatory sites. And um, this is, ah, we're still not, we took this out here. This is probably stable later in life um, with maybe a few changes in the regulatory regions that uh, need to be further defined. But um, talking to epigenetic experts in other fields of biology, they say a terminally differentiated cell needs a stable DNA methylome. If not, it would turn into a cancer cell. So, so that, that's why, uh, because in... in Cardiac field, usually we lean towards, do we find changes? Of course, uh, there should be changes. But um, with, with more advanced purification, and um, this is stable. I will go into these enhancers now a little bit, because here is an, a gap. And we don't really know which enhancer regulates which gene, which brings us to additional layers. Um, and the additional layers, um, I've mentioned the RNA, the histones, DNA methylation, is the organization of chromatin within the nucleus. <clears throat> and that has been uh, a large issue um, um, fairly recently, uh, observing that if I enlarge this area, basically the DNA is, is wrapped in, in larger loops. So it's not only the looping around the histones, but it's larger loops, and it's probably these loop contacts where, where contacts between an enhancer and a gene occur. Those are called um, the transcriptionally active domain loops. Then there is larger chromatin structure, uh, which is called compartments. We have the active <coughs> compartments that are probably mostly localized within the nucleus, and heterochromatin inactive compartments close to the lamina and the nuclear periphery. So we can now start to investigate these features of higher order chromatin structure by high C sequencing. This is such a result. Basically, one is shearing the DNA, formally fixing it, and trying to find out who is making contact with whom, because we can sequence them. If they're in contact, you read through. You have one part from this piece of DNA uh, and one from this. And this ends up as this map of uh, Egyptian pyramids. Everything under one of these pyramids is in contact with each other. So um, you see that obviously there are houses, pyramids, or whatever you may call them. There are areas. And these areas, if one puts that, that connection map into a principal component analysis, will lead up to um, a classification based on, uh, that's called, uh, based on the principal components analysis as A and B compartments. These here, B being in the periphery and A in the middle. And now we can ask the question, if we have these large A and B compartments, this is an A, this is an A, you see already in the B compartments, none of the signals for histones 
really pops up except for the, for the heterochromatic marks. Gene expression, CTCF, cohesin, RNA signal, active histone marks, all DNA methylation, all happens here. The A compartments are the things where, where at least based on cardiac myocytes, the action is. In a cardiac myocyte, 45% of the genome is A compartments, and you see the stronger signals for all of these marks. And the other little bit more than half is B compartments, probably never used. So this is an indication of, what some colleagues say, um, epigenetics is reading in the book of life. Wow. Um, so these, these are the chapters in this book of life that are never, or at least in this condition, not used. Maybe bone or whatever. Uh, so kind of the A compartment. There is very little knowledge of what are the molecular mechanisms that generate or, and control these basic compartments. We ask ourselves whether DNA methylation that was supposed to have a, um, an effect on these compartments would be important. So we deleted from embryonic stem cells and from cardiac myocytes as many copies of those enzymes as we can do. You can see here in embryonic stem cells get uh, very well uh, uh, along without DNA methylation. And with and without DNA methylation, BA, BA, the structure is same. Cardiac myocytes, double knockout. We can't knock out DNMT1 in addition because that's lethal. But at least uh, the <coughs> double knockout of this one, the, um, the structure is identical. So it's not DNA methylation that drives this. We need to see, but this is now a model. Second aspect, uh, briefly, I'd like to mention only a very few slides going into in vitro derived cells. We have no big experience, but we thought if now we're looking at a maturation process, let's um, use this model. We teamed up with Ben Fleischmann, um, where basically mouse embryonic stem cells are stably transfected with an alpha myosin cardiac alpha MHC promoter driving pure myosin resistance with EGFP. These are beating cardiac myocytes. Gene expression in these differentiated ES-derived cardiac myocytes is, is totally def, uh, depends on where you're looking. Some genes are very well expressed. Those are the uh, blue ones. Some, some show a mature signature. Others show an immature signature. And here are some examples. Proliferation markers are off. K67, myosin light chain, uh, embryonic... Uh, Stem cell derived cardiac myosin should be off, is still on. There is no very clear pattern of what's happening. We wanted to look at DNA methylation. Are they, uh, how, how is the epigenome mature? Here is the Hox A cluster, very important for development. Upper trace, the DNA <coughs> methylation in embryonic stem cells, lowest trace in ES derived cardiac myocytes. If you compare these black traces with these purple ones, it looks absolutely identical. As if during the differentiation where the cells are beating, they forgot the Hox cluster. Maybe they don't have to care about it, but no, no signature here. Sorry, this should be adult cardiac myocytes. This is a mislabeling. You can see the comparison. The Hox cluster in vivo is demethylated very early on and is, of course, later being switched off, but this is a histone mark. Polycomb will do the job to switch it off. So this is, so as if, and we also see Hox expression. So this is one part. Now, on a general basis, we ask the question, how mature is the epigenome of in vitro differentiated cardiac myocytes? We have the map of mouse um, cardiac myocytes from progenitor throughout fetal to adult stage and can look uh, at principal component analysis uh, at DNA methylation. And I've basically shown this. You see here that from ES cells to progenitor to fetal life to newborn and adult, DNA methylation matures. It takes a long while to get the driver's license for the DNA methylation. Um, the AB compartments are much faster. They're actually preceding in vivo. And now the uh, in vitro differentiated um, methylation is more or less fetal. This is PC analysis. 
but A compartments, A, B compartments, absolutely ready. Fascinating to see. I don't know what to make out of it and what process is this, but this is the most mature epigenetic process that we've seen so far in in vitro generated cardiac myocytes. They know very well how to make their basic chromatin architecture fully matured around uh, similar to this. So they have the chance now to complete only the few remaining steps, maybe here, complete their gene expression, and then their full cardiac myocytes. What is missing? We don't really know yet. If we look at those methylated regions, which are different between adult and ES-derived cardiac myocytes, we see that these regulatory sites seem to differ second to last and last column in the number of transcription factor <laughs> binding sites. So maybe it's transcription factors that are lacking. For instance, here in adult cardiac myocytes, um, the expression of transcription factors uh, are much higher here than in the S-derived sites, and that matches with the motive enrichment, where you see CTCF, MEF2, GADA is lacking compared. This is not huge differences, but it probably matters where we are. So uh, we would like to investigate now whether using transcription factors to drive the remaining regions to full maturation, including DNA methylation, might be an option. OK, DNA methylation uh, was the largest part. We see that it's very essential for cardiac myocyte development, uh, maturation, and also for this um, um, building the regions of the master switches. So what about coming back just very briefly to heart failure, epigenetics and heart failure. We actually entered the whole field by looking at mouse models of um, pressure overload and reversal by unloading um, and LVET samples uh, from human heart failure. And MECP2 brought us into this field. I would just briefly mention this. MECP2, the protein that recognizes and binds to methylated DNA. And we found that in the heart, basically, it's repressed in hypertrophy. I could have shown the same also for human hearts. After unloading, its levels on RNA and protein revert to. This seemed to, this was our first indication, an old knockout mice that was born at Stanford. Uh, presynaptic increased sympathetic stress also had this repression and which brought us about I'm not spending too much time on this um, that that this the repression is probably at least in part mediated by a microRNA driven pathway and um, then we uh, checked where is MECP2 in the heart um, MECP2 binding after so it's repressed protein decreases <coughs> and the spining signal in heart failure decreases, but at the same target genes, the DNA methylation level is identical. So it's the reader that's flexible. Um, to test that idea, we generated transgenic overexpressors and knockout mice, subjected them to TAC and reversal of TAC, and you see overexpressors, which don't show this um, adaptation, um, recover slower, whereas the knockout in this situation, they may recover faster. So that we feel uh, it might be the proteins that adapt to this in a shorter term um, are, need, to, need to be flexible. And you, you can now speculate about all the upstream layers as well. However, that nicely fits only very few slides from literature again to the concept that also the reader proteins for the histones may be so important, and I would like to mention um, just, just the BRD4. I showed you these slides where ANP, BNP, with increased um, level of heart failure, we have increased expression and histone acetylation, and um, this acetylation, for instance here, can be recognized by bromodomain proteins, and um, JQ1 has been this this leading substance of interfering with bromo domains and histone marks and SAP, um, SAP Haldar um, at uh, his previous times and now at UCSF has done beautiful work 
showing that JQ1 uh, may prevent decreased uh, dysfunction in mouse hearts or even under treatment and fibrotic damage. Although I must admit that the full, we don't know the full mechanism of this inhibition of, of <coughs> bromodomain proteins yet. We can discuss this. Um, this will be my second to final slide. Where do I see epigenetics coming up in the cardiovascular field beyond what I was mentioning? Well, I guess there is a very strong case in congenital heart failure or congenital heart disease. Uh, consortia um, from pediatric uh, genomics uh, fields in the US mostly have published over the years number of mutations in kids with congenital heart disease that centered these were the epigenetic genes that are mutated and associated with heart disease in 2013. Now they have a large number of um, sequencing studies with whole exome. Um, and this is a list of who is who. If I show this to our epigenetic guys, they feel it's like, wow, this can also not be true. It's too many epigenetic proteins um, that might be associated. So I do see that we need to know much more about um, these proteins that are mutated, their role in chromatin biology, but also in cardiac biology, and potentially first their contribution how this would cause congenital heart disease. This is whole exome sequencing, so only the coding. The, 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 this um, Bruce Gelb, I mentioned this name here, we're collaborating with Bruce um, to look into our regulatory region and the whole genome sequencing now to identify whether there are additional SNPs in the, and it looks promising, although that's a relatively difficult route. I'd like to summarize. Um, I've uh, taken you through a heavy sequencing based uh, journey deep into the cardiac myocyte to show that DNA methylation is important um, during development but rather stable than during the remainder after, after the cardiac myocyte has obtained its driver's license, so probably beyond uh, birth. Um, that uh, in, in disease we see strong signals that are associated with pathological gene expression on flexible expression of the reader proteins, may it be for DNA methylation or, or histone marks, um, and both uh, seem to be uh, interesting therapeutic targets. And, and uh, I do see that we need to do more research into the area of, of the reader, writer, and reza proteins and their genes in congenital heart disease. I would like to mention um, the, and thank uh, the external collaborators, some of them I have mentioned. Ralf Gilsbach is a group leader now in our department who, uh, with uh, Sebastian, started the, um, the mouse sequencing work. Sebastian is now um, head of single cell genomics at UCSD after one and a half years of postdoc, amazing. Um, Stefan Notjunger, the 3D work, and the whole team. Um, if you're interested, you may want to, we, we have a beta version of all of these traces, so if you're interested, um, check it out. Um, this beta version, you, you get all the traces online when you type in your favorite gene of interest or your microRNA, and you can see, is it decorated with this histone? Is it demethylated or whatever? This needs to be built, but it's a, like a small project. So with this, um, I thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take any questions you might have.